That's awesome. There's a lot of like queeros and homos in the audience. That makes me really happy. Um, so my name is Kim Crosby, but I'm just... That's what you were talking about. The noise that it makes. Like this? Should I do this? I'm going to be right here and never have that happen again. Thank you everybody for being here. It's so incredible to see this many folks out here on the lawn. I know it's been a really hot day. So thank you. So I'm going to go right into it. Thank you to the organizers, to all of the people who made it possible for me to be here. I do not and never have done this alone, and I reject a lot of the celebrityism that comes with this work. There are people who came before, are here now, and will come after, who we may never see, and they are just as valuable to this movement as the people we see here today. Yes. I also want to acknowledge that we are on First Nations land and acknowledge the labor of enslaved people that constructed this country. I want us to acknowledge migrant workers, domestic foreign workers, and folks visiting up the pillar visit industrial complex. Hurt people hurt people. And even in our experience of violence, we are all accountable for the ways in which we par participate in and perpetuate systems of violence, including racism, transphobia, ableism, and classism. We all have responsibilities to consider how to make this world one that we all want to live in, are all entitled to live in with an abundance of respect, safety, and love. And as bodies with complex, layered identities, our responsibilities are profoundly different. We each exist simultaneously in possession of privilege and of experiences of oppression. And while I have no desire to play oppression Olympics, we have to realize that they're not in equal amounts. Our social identities and our social political context are not optional when we engage in dialogues about accountability, how to build safe communities, and challenging these systems. The, con the context that we live in literally defines some bodies as better than others. We are swimming in it. The point isn't that differences exist. It's not about who is different and why, or whether these differences are constructed or biologically defined, or whether the difference falls into a dichotomy. It's the fact that we live in a society that privileges distance, differences associated with a certain class and group over all else. These systems and rules take differences and declare them as a disadvantage on an institutional level. It declares differences as being criminal. And so what of us, those of us who stand at the intersections of race, class, gender, and sexuality? I am so fundamentally concerned with our strategies for resistance and self-care, our experience of state-inflicted sanctioned violence, and I am primarily concerned with the breaking open of spaces where our voices are heard in such a way that they are able to consistently inform policy, education, and justice. <laughs> My mama is one quarter Venezuelan Arawak and one quarter Dutch and a half Indo Trinidadian. My father, my father is half Scottish white plantation owner and half West African slave stock bred in Dominica. My father's father was a plantation owner who raped my grandmother and he was referred to in my family as Massa. And this is the legacy I come from. I was born in Trinidad and raised in Toronto. I am able-bodied, English-speaking, female assigned at birth, an immigrant but with Canadian citizenship that my mama fought for on my behalf. These are a few of the privileges that I enjoy. I did not earn them and they have no intrinsic value despite the enormous value that they are assigned and the benefits that I reap. I have never been incarcerated even though I participate in a system that does violent criminal things daily both here in Canada and all over the world. I identify as a queer femme, as a short skirt wearing, heels rocking, push up bra wearing. My granny left me a legacy of feminists, suffering in silence and head to toe glamour and with a brilliant wit. I learned about feminists from drag queens like Jade Electra, who taught me how to apply makeup, walk right in heels, and feel courage in the face of violence. Trans women like Monica Roberts, Octavia Saint Laurent taught me that femininity is radical, powerful, and not to be fucked with. Women of color, women of color like Dulce Garcia, Omi Sheree Dryden showed me just how brown, red, black, and yellow femme really was. Makeup is war paint. People across the world adorn their faces to reflect art, emotion, and history. Always have and always will. And the time and the self-care that goes into wearing makeup is healing. And in a world that decries that I'm not only black and ugly, but a sexual object to be consumed, to dare to adorn my temple is an act of resistance and worship and should be regarded as such. And 
the glitter and the tight dresses armor, I feel protected, expressive, I feel like me. As a young girl, I was too sexy, too developed, constantly being compared to standards of white girlhood, and never found to be deserving of that innocence. And as a survivor of rape, sexual assault in my home and outside of it, this isn't social justice work, this is a matter of life and death. Yes. Over the course of my life, violence has come in the form of caregivers, street harassment at the hands of partners, both male and female. I was introduced to sex and sexual desire at a very young age. And let me be specific, I was introduced to being sexually desired at a profoundly wrong age. I felt deep, gut-wrenching shame and so much responsibility. And I developed quickly. By 13, I was told I looked grown. And this is something I also really want to challenge. By whose standards do I look grown? I look like many other black, Latina women of my age, girls my age, but the standard of white femininity proposes that women of color, black, Latina, indigenous women, our bodies are inherently sexualized. Ask yourself why big breasts or big asses mean sex. And why do we constantly participate in the hypersexualization of women of color? To me, as Mia Minka says, femme must include ending ableism, white supremacy, heterosexism, the gender binary, economic exploitation, sexual violence, population control, male supremacy, war, militarization, and the ownership of children and land, and I can do it in fucking pink. I explain all of this because I want you to know that I am on purpose and that femme is on purpose. As E. Smith says, I want to live in a world where little people are not pinkified, but where little people who like pink are not punished for it either. Let's stop denying people their own autonomy by telling them that their expressions of femininity are bad and wrong. Anti-femininity has no place in my fucking movement, and it isn't revolutionary to uphold the status quo. As women of color, racialized and First Nations women and folks, what we wear, the context that we are in, has so little to do with the experience of safety in the world. And as a black woman, I cannot separate my experience of safety in the world from other black people. And this includes Trayvon, Trayvon Martin, the Jersey Seven, and Cece McDonald. Yeah. On June 14th, 2007, Four black women received sentences ranging from three and a half to 11 years in prison. None of them had previous criminal records. Two of them are parents of small children. They were defending themselves from a physical attack by a man who held them down, choked them, ripped hair from their scalps, spat on them, and threatened to sexually assault them, all because they are lesbians, and much of the assault was even caught on tape. And Cece McDonald. Around 12.30 a.m., Cece was walking through the grocery store with some friends, all of them young and black and queer or allied, and they passed a local bar. A group of older white people were standing outside the bar side door and began hurling racist and transphobic comments without provocation. They called Cece and her friends faggots, niggers, chicks with dicks, and suggested that Cece was dressed as a woman in order to rape Dean Schmitz, one of the attackers. When she approached the group and told them that her crew would not tolerate their hate speech, one of the women said, I'll take you bitches on, and smashed her glass into Cece's face. She punctured her cheek all the way through. A fight ensued during which one of the attackers was fatally stabbed, and Cece was arrested, interrogated without a lawyer present, held in solitary confinement, and charged with murder. And I think we all know the case of Trayvon Martin, but at the same time, a black woman, also living in Florida, fired warning shots into the air to stop her abusive husband from attacking her, and she killed no one and was sentenced to 20 years in prison and denied the same standard ground law that protected George Zimmerman. Our endurance should not be confused with transformation. It is simply not enough to offer us such surface platitudes as don't give up and it gets better. Yes. Black yes. women are so yes. often characterized as angry without taking into consideration the sheer amount of violence we experience. I am angry and there are reasons. Yes. Our anger and our sadness, our pain are the products of a system that works so diligently to erase us. Low self-esteem, lack of hope, are actually reasonable responses to unreasonably depressing circumstances. Yeah. It doesn't get better unless we do something about it. Yeah. It's not about 
about the hoodie, it's not about the hijab, whether you're at home or in the streets. These are, these are all pseudo arguments which skirt the real problem. Recognizing that these systems are created with an economic purpose behind them. They are meant to keep us fighting among ourselves. Yes, this is yes. why we can feel the whole competition between women thing. It's real because there is a scarcity model. They give us so little to work with and we're so willing to fight each other for it. But really we need to be directing that at the people who hold on to all this power. Yes. Yes. is discriminated against because of the negative meaning assigned to being female. Blackness in all bodies is discriminated against because of the negative meaning assigned to being black. It's not our gender or our skin color that we have to change, but these systems of oppression that benefit some group at the expense of others. Privilege happens at the expense of others. This whole process is what William Ryan called blaming the victim. It's an ideological process that justifies inequality by finding de uh, defects in the victims of inequality. So this, what, what this looks like is if a woman gets raped, everyone rushes to see where she let her guard down. Was she drinking? Was she alone? Was she wearing a short skirt? How old did she look? How old did she act? What did she look like? Did she go to a strange man's room at 4 a.m.? We have statistics upon statistics about women who are violated, but not about the men who are violating. What were they drinking? What were they saying? A woman should be able to walk down the street at four in the morning in nothing but her socks, blind drunk, without being assaulted. And I, for one, am not going to do anything to imply that she in any way is responsible for her own assault if she fails to adequately protect herself. Men are not helpless, dick-driven maniacs who can't help raping a vulnerable woman. It disrespects everyone to think like that. We cannot blame the most vulnerable bodies in a system. We have to condemn the system. These experiences are further complicated by ability, class, status, as well as other social locations. Differently abled women have an additional layer of dehumanization, which often cloaks their experience of sexual violence at the hands of caregivers and in the medical industrial complex. Non-status women and incarcerated women are provided no recourse in cases of violence and are faced with threat of deportation or continued violence. And cash poor women and girls' voices are constantly devalued and silenced and cannot afford the luxury of time to heal, heal, so are often forced to continue their labor post as well as during sexual assault. We must recognize that there is a kind of privilege and complexity that comes from claiming the world slut and dressing like a slut. Knowing that for the vast majority of these women who are victimized through rape, sexual harassment, and sexual violence, and state-sanctioned violence, that that's impossible for them. And we must be duly careful not to conflate the idea that the only way to be liberated is to be found in bearing one's body. Women need to be just as free to cover their bodies, to wear the hijab, without your Western savior rhetoric, without a press brown body. We must continue to affirm the existence of different simultaneous narratives. One of our experiences does not invalidate the other. We are not all the same. Our experiences are vastly different. And in our decision to collaborate, we must not erase each other. We are not a monolith. We are wildly different in our histories and our experiences. And we need to trust each other in our description of our realities. Yes. So often we are told to prioritize knowledge that is objective. But no one is objective. We all have our own experiences, our own lenses, and our own biases. We are all subjective, and the danger comes when we don't name that. I am a female assigned at birth, and I will never be able to speak with more authority about transphobia than my trans siblings. Anything I have learned has been at their expense and has been graciously shared, and I will treat that as the gift that it is. And we need to be able to do that with each other. Trust your struggle. You do not need a man to justify the experience of sexism, and I don't need white folks to affirm my lived daily reality of racialized sexism. <laughs> Subjectivity is a powerful fucking place. What happens? What happens when the specimen that you have under the magnifying glass speaks back? When the subject of the anthropological study raises their hand in class and says, no, that is simply not true. Keep speaking out as the experts of your own experiences. Tell your truths and step back and allow others whose voices are not often acknowledged to take up more space. Know that there are multiple narratives that all exist at the exact same time. Exactly the same time. And the truth of another should complicate your own, but not invalidate. 
There is an enormous privilege that comes from the ability to change what you're wearing or where you're walking and to be able to find safety, even relative safety. The normalization of the disappearance, rape, torture, and murder of black women, women of color, and First Nations women who may and may not be cash poor, differently able, possessing status, queer, trans, is a part of the foundation of this country and of Western Euro science, justice, and government. And I never get to take a break from it. These are our lives and these are our bodies. And even if we like sex that's rough or explores rape fantasies, even if we love or have deep appreciation for masculine energy, regardless of the body that it comes in, the fact of the matter is, is that it's consent that's what turns us on. And it is possible for me to protest misogyny with my legs spread wide open, and I intend to do just that. And as much as I wish I didn't have to say this, we have to say this. Don't rape us. Don't shout slurs at us in the street and check anyone who does. Do not act with ownership over our bodies. Always ask us what we want. No is not yes. Maybe all. is not yes. Silence is not yes. Yes means yes, and that's it. Don't police, don't police our bodies, and that includes how we dress, how we fuck, and how we birth, and if we birth. Don't drug us, slip us things in our drinks, wait till we're drunk, these things are not consent. We are not responsible for getting you off, or tempting you, or in general, for your lack of self-control. That's why it's called self-control. We are children of the universe, no less than the sun or stars. It's about time you started acting like it. Thank you.